Hi, everyone who's joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. You're on the right Zoom channel. Hello, everyone who's just joining us. Hi there. We'll be with you in just a second. Just waiting for Facebook to get up to speed. <laughs> so we'll be able to watch it afterwards, Facebook and YouTube. Thank you so much. Oh, fantastic. Thanks so much for joining us in this virtual allied organization event during the Democratic National Convention, Electing Equality, the final push for the Equal Rights Amendment. Hello, everyone. I'm Carol Jenkins. I'm co-president and CEO of the ERA Coalition and the Fund for Women's Equality. We're comprised of over 100 nationwide organizations, all working to put the ERA onto the Constitution to give girls and women full equality. We're thrilled to be holding this event on the centennial anniversary of the date Tennessee became the last state needed to vote for the ratification of the women's vote. That was, uh, you know, quite, quite an event. Uh, we are celebrating all that all this week, and this is the very day that Tennessee passed the vote. It took a few days before it got to D.C., which is why we celebrate Women's Equality Day later. Uh, but uh, we have on uh, board today almost 1,700 people uh, that you've signed up. We have over 250 questions, which is so incredible. We thank you so much for your involvement and, uh, and for your interest. Uh, we've got some program notes before we get started. Please share your thoughts on social media with the hashtag electing equality. And if so moved, you may donate by texting vote to 243725. That's 243725. And uh, you can do that during the program and after at any time. Uh, this program is being recorded and will be available on Facebook and on YouTube. And finally, we do have closed captioning available by clicking uh, the window at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we'll repeat all of this information a few times uh, during the program so that you can share your thoughts and uh, give to the cause. Uh, we appreciate it so much and we're really thrilled that you all are here. It's now my great pleasure to introduce my colleague and partner in this event, uh, a longtime ERA champion, our leader, Eleanor Smeal, president of the Feminist Majority, who's going to share her hopes uh, for the discussions today. Ellie. Thank you, Carol. Uh, this, I want to frame this a little bit. Uh, starting with 1970, I can't go back to 23, but remember this was a, a target of the and a goal of the suffragist movement itself to get full equality in the Constitution and to end sex discrimination once and for all. And here we are in a in in, uh, 100th anniversary, but we still are cleaning up the work of the 70s. And essentially what happened in the 70s, as you well know, is that, it, that we got through the Senate and we thought that it was gonna be easy selling. We should have noticed some things that happened in 1971, Nixon vetoed the child care bill, and, and, um, and which was a horrible setback. We've never come that close on child care again. But in 72, we passed Title IX, which guaranteed equal educational opportunity. And we thought, okay, Title IX, ERA all the way. But what's happened? Republicans have keep on uh, almost every president has pushed back Title IX. We're fighting right now a regressive movement by the current Secretary of Education to undermine Title IX as an instrument to fight sexual assault on campus. One of the things we've known from all the gives and takes is we've got to have a guarantee of no sex discrimination. It has to be settled once and for all. And that's why we're here. This is the final push for equal rights. Uh, we believe that we can do it. 
Uh, in fact, what we, we, we name this elect inequality because on the ballot, in addition to saving democracy, will be the Equal Rights Amendment because there's no question about it. If we flip the Senate and flip the White House, the instructions will be from the archivist to certify the ERA and both the Senate and the House, we will believe, we believe in the first 90 day, first 100 days, will do what they have to do, which is to remove the deadline and will be even better shape for the Supreme Court. Either way, we're going to the Supreme Court and we're gonna go there as a major election issue. We're gonna make these polls come to life. It, we're way ahead in the polls, over 90%, and it's time now to do it. Right, thank you, Ellie, so much. It is time, and remember that every candidate you vote for should be a pro-woman, pro-ERA candidate, up and down uh, the, the ballot. Thank you so much, Ellie. And we're gonna be uh, talking during this program, uh, exploring the future, how we get there. Uh, we have our several uh, guest panelists, and we have some special guests who will be arriving during the, uh, the two hours of the program. Uh, introducing our panel, uh, the wonderful, the great, Dolores Huerta, organizer and activist supreme. She's president of the Dolores Huerta Foundation. And I will say, if you haven't seen the documentary about her life, you must. You will be so inspired. Dolores, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, do you want to talk with us a little bit about your connection and your belief in the Equal Rights Amendment? Oh, absolutely. I think this is so important because this is going to set a framework, uh, not only here in our country, but through, throughout the world. And it is a framework that we can uh, refer to uh, so that all little girls, you know, will know that they are equal to men and that they will actually be, be empowered. And this is what women need to know, that they do have that power and that they can't, can't take their places especially in the decision-making positions, uh, you know, that we need throughout the world, because we know when you have a feminist perspective, you have a peace perspective. Uh, when you have a feminist perspective, you're talking about sharing, cooperation, respect, carrying all of the things that women bring to the table, and of course, leadership. And so this is why the ERA is so important, because it sends a message throughout, throughout the world that we as women, this is what we want. This is what we want our world to be. We don't want to, our world to be one of, of oppression, discrimination, sexism, violence, seduction, you know, all of these horrible things that women have to go through. And this affects not only women, but it, it affects our entire world. So yes, when we have ERA, this is a path to leadership for women. It opens the door. Thank you so much, Dolores Guerta. Glad that you're the lead, the lead of this fight with, uh, with Ellie. Thank you. And, and so many others. Speaking of being in the lead, Tina Chen, former director of the Office for Women and Girls uh, in the Obama White House, the chief of staff of Michelle Obama, and special advisor to President Obama. Tina, your link to the ERA. Are you unmuted, Tina? Or Yes, you would think uh, after five months in the, in, in the quarantine, we'd all know how to do that. <laughs> but we sort of forget in this new world that we're in. So thank you so much for having me and uh, you know letting me join as a part of this. Um, the Equal Rights Amendment is actually very much how I got introduced to the women's movement. Uh, because as Ellie knows, she and I met some 40 years ago in 1978, when as a young, fresh out of college, um, a young person, I moved to Springfield, Illinois to work for state government back then. And who knew that Springfield would become the center of American feminism, but it was in those last three years between 1978 and 81, when we tried to get Illinois, which was the only Northern industrial state that at that point had not yet ratified the ERA, to ratify as the linchpin to get the last three states. And Ellie was there as president of the National Organization for Women. Every major feminist leader was there. Gloria Steinem came in. It was also the place where we saw the rise of Phyllis Schlafly. So we had sort of daily battles in the rotunda of the Capitol building between those of us supporting the ERA dressed in our green and white garb and the antis, as we called them, dressed in red and white. But it's very much, as I've told Ellie before, it is, was my introduction to the women's movement 
to fighting for gender equity. It became my life's work as I have continued now and through to the great honor I had in the, in the Obama administration. And one of the things Carol and I did in the Obama administration is I, I had the opportunity to interact with a lot of dignitaries from overseas. And more than once, you know, someone I can remember sitting in Tanzania talking about their constitution and with some bit of pride, the minister from Tanzania I was sitting next to said, said, well, we recognize women in our constitution. So everyone around the world knows that as much as we claim to be the bedrock of democracy, we actually are one of the constitutions that do not recognize women's rights explicitly in our constitution. And so that's why it's really critical that we get the ERA into our constitution once and for all. Great, Tina, thanks so much. Uh, Alyssa Milano, actor and activist, social media force, and member of the ERA Coalition Advisory <laughs> Board. She's been with us uh, with, in so much of our work on Capitol Hill. Uh, Alyssa. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I just wanna start by thanking the ERA Coalition and Feminist Majority um, for including me in this panel with, with so many of my, my heroes. Um, my name is Alyssa Milano, and I fight for the ERA because passing an equal rights amendment would, for the first time in our country's history, open a pathway toward true gender equality. You know, the, the ERA would just, it would really set a norm for equal pay, for equal work, so that women can be full economic actors in our society. It would protect pregnant women from dis discrimination so that you know, we don't have to make the impossible choice between earning a paycheck and having a family, you know, between making a living and, and, and living in our own bodies. Um, it would require states to enforce laws against gender violence. You know, ratifying the ERA would be a statement of principle. It would send a message to our daughters. It would send a message to our sons. It would send a message to every state in the country. And it would send a message to the world. <coughs> These rights are our birthright, but enshrining them in our constitution is our responsibility. And because, you know, in a democracy, progress it doesn't just happen automatically. Democracy requires action by us because at the end of the day, it really is us. So thank right. you for having me. Thanks, thanks so much, Alyssa. Well, speaking of action, Nevada State Senator Pat Spear Spearman is up next and it's safe to say that we wouldn't be in such a celebratory mood and so close if Pat and Nevada had not kicked off the recent round of ratifications in 2017. You know, Pat, you know how much we worship you all for, for starting that uh, and bringing us all here. Well, um, I, I, don't, I don't know if that's, uh, if that's warranted. I'll just say that we did what we had to do. My name is uh, Senator Pat Spearman, and I'm a state senator from the great state of Nevada. We became number 36, and uh, 37 and 38 uh, came in shortly behind us. I support the ERA for all the reasons that um, some of my colleagues on this panel, this panel has already said. Uh, I support it because it's the right thing to do. I support it because we've got to make sure that equality and equity are in the Constitution for us. And it's not just about equality for women, but it's equality for everyone. When we win, everyone wins. I support it because I think that it's a shame that a woman who has been sexually assaulted has to prove that she did not ask for it, that she did not deserve it. And so the Equal Rights Amendment takes all of that away and starts from the premise that yes, she has been wronged and then the criminal justice system takes it from there. I also support the Equal Rights Amendment because there are some people in, um, in my ancestry who fought very hard and very long for equality. I fight for the ERA for Willie Mae Tyree, who is my maternal grandmother. I fight for Mabel Spearman, who is my paternal grandmother. I fight for my mother, Hazel Johnson, and I fight for all of my sisters and my nieces and all of the women around the world who are yearning, not for special rights, but for equal rights. And so I fight for the ERA because we're standing on the shoulders of giants and I can do no less. 
Uh, Pat, thank you, thank you. And a giant yourself. And speaking of other giants, we're gonna break a little bit before we meet the rest of our panelists because Congresswoman Barbara Lee uh, has arrived, the esteemed Congresswoman from California's 13th district, former chair of the Congressional Black Caucus and current co-chair of the Democratic Steering Committee, which means folks that she is in the top, top tier of uh, leadership in the party. Uh, Congresswoman Lee, thanks so much for being with us. Today. Ah, thank you so much for that very warm and spirited introduction. It is so good to see my warrior women here today. Uh, thank you all so much for leading the way uh, for so, so many years. Uh, gosh, let me uh, just applaud everyone also who's uh, joining us today for their unceasing commitment to uh, the ERA and to equality. Now, you know, uh, I know Ellie, I know Dolores, I know you all know that, um, and you remember that my mentor was the Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, uh, the first right. African-American woman elected to Congress and the first African-American woman to run for the presidency. Okay, now Shirley uh, is certainly smiling on all of us today. Her role in the movement for equality and for the ERA we all know her trailblazing work for women, and especially for women of color. And we know that uh, she would share our joy in this moment as we gathered uh, this week to nominate uh, my senator, our senator, and Oakland native Kamala Harris as the first African-American woman for vice president. Kamala has always been a fierce advocate for all women, especially women of color, during her time in the Senate and throughout her career. And now this November, after we do our work, first protecting and then turning out our vote. Uh, she will take the baton from Shirley Chisholm, run this lap, next lap of the race with, uh, race with uh, our president, Joe Biden. So while we're making progress for equality, we know that so much work remains. 100 years after women fought for and still and won the right to vote, the Equal Rights Amendment has still and shamefully still not been enshrined in our constitution. It's really a shame and disgrace. We know what the NRA, ERA means to women. We know the devastating impact that the wage gap among women, especially women of color, and I too must salute my mother, who was the first, one of the first 12 African-Americans to integrate to the University of Texas at El Paso, but one was the first black woman to work at Fort Bliss, Texas. She broke so many barriers as the first African-American woman, but you know what? Her wages were totally, totally, disproportionate in terms of the work that she was performing as it relates to men. And so I too want to salute my mother today for uh, paving the way, paving the way and trailblazing and having to deal with such horrible, horrible wage discrimination in pay because she was black. We know the impact of pregnancy discrimination, sexual harassment in the workplace and serious barriers that women face in so many aspects of our lives. And we know that these barriers, once again, are more extreme for women of color. And of course, these barriers lead to women being underrepresented at the decision-making table at a time when our voices are needed more than ever. The ERA would guarantee equal rights to all, regardless of gender, and finally affirming women's equality in our constitution. So many other countries have done this, yet America has them. Shame on us. Right, the ERA right. will, shame on us, will advance, it will advance quality, equality, excuse me, and quality of education for women, progress for families, and will ensure a stronger America, and we certainly need that now. Passing the NRA, ERA, I keep saying NRA, I am so <laughs> into fighting and beating back the gun lobby right now. Exactly. <laughs> we, we, we understand, we understand. And women are in the lead of that also. <laughs> Right, the right. The ERA is such a matter of economic justice and, yes, racial justice that will help right. close the wage gap for women of color. And so, so finally, let me just say uh, how happy I am to be with you. Women deserve to have their equality recognized and enshrined in the Constitution. And let me thank Congresswoman Jackie Speer and her amendment to remove the ratification deadline, which is another obstacle to enactment. So thank you again. It's so wonderful to see everybody and wonderful to be here with you. 
great, great. Do you have, if you have time for one quick question, yeah. since you are, mm -hmm. you are in the leadership and we know that uh, the ERA is in the platform, the Democratic platform, and yes. very high up this time around, thank yes. you so much, and that it's in Joe Biden's women's agenda, uh, that yes. Kamala Harris has expressed explicit support for the Equal Rights Amendment. What are the chances, you think, of having this rise to the first 100 days of really getting the Equal Rights Amendment for Women taken care of very early, if there, if there should be a Biden administration? Well, there will be if we do our work. And I think <laughs> women are definitely going to do their work to make sure that there is a Biden-Harris administration. And I was on the drafting committee of the platform and also the platform committee. And believe you me, we discussed this. The ERA is at the top of the agenda uh, for this next administration. And so I'm confident that uh, we have to be aggressive, assertive, and ambitious, yes, to make sure that uh, come January, uh, this, this moves forward. But uh, I can tell you one thing, re repealing the Hyde Amendment is in the platform, repealing the Helms amend Amendment is in the platform, and other major, major women's equality provisions of our platform, I know that the Biden-Harris uh, administration will embrace. So yes, we have a lot of work to do to get past November, but yes, I'm confident it will be top priority. Well, great. We thank you so much for stopping by. I know that you have a million things to do and you always make time for us and we're so appreciative. Oh, no, and thank you. You, thank you all are warrior women and I just have to salute everybody and say thank you very much. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Uh, we've also been joined with, uh, by Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia from the 29th District, Eastern Houston, Texas, who uh, spoke so movingly at the uh, judiciary hearing that led up to the House dissolving the time limit. And, and Congresswoman Garcia, we remember your marks and we thank you so, so much for being so passionate about the Equal Rights Amendment. Well, first of all, thank you again for the invitation to join you this afternoon. And it's good to see some familiar faces on the screen and for all my new friends. Hello, Dolores. <laughs> you know, I got to start with Dolores Huerta because she and I go back to farm worker days. You know, as some of you know, like I grew up poor in South Texas and I was a farm worker, but, but not in agriculture products. I picked cotton and did some other things, but uh, she knows that I always stand with the farm workers and I still remember uh, spending one great weekend, well, long weekend with her uh, campaigning for Hillary. We were Hillary surrogates. Uh, we campaigned in Indiana of all places, uh, but we made it work. Remember, Dolores? Uh, it was such a fun time. Uh, and there's no better uh, person to have to, to know the history of the Latino movement and particularly the farm worker movement than having Dolores work there with you in the car all weekend. I uh, learned a lot. <laughs> Uh, but thank you to my colleague, Barbara Lee. Uh, uh, you know, she and I both served on the drafting committee, uh, and she's absolutely right. Uh, Joe Biden made sure that that platform has everything that we need to know uh, and to support when it comes to equal rights for women. Yes, it's the RA, it's the Equal Pay Act, it's the Violence Against Women. You name it, it's there, and he's committed to it. And there was absolutely no problems on the platform committee uh, getting those those uh, things on the agenda. So uh, I think uh, people are going to embrace it. Uh, and I do agree with, with, with Congresswoman Lee that uh, uh, as long as we work our asses, um, uh, we will get it done. I still remember, for those of you, and I know El Ellie Smill was probably there at the uh, International Women's Year Congress in 19, conference in 1977 yes, yes. in Houston. In 77, I was a Texas delegate. And I'll never forget one of the posters that it said, on our asses till the ERA passes. <laughs> you know, that still works for today uh, because we are really going to have to work our asses off until we make sure that the ERA passes. Uh, it is a long time coming. It is overdue. Shame on us. Shame on us that it hasn't passed. Shame on us that we haven't followed the lead of other countries in, 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 in setting a goal of every, every elected governing body to be 50% women. Shame on us that we've not done the things uh, that other countries have. Now, I've been committed to this since the first time I set foot at the Texas Capitol back as a law student uh, to go and, and, and listen to the ERA hearings. And I'm pleased to say that on this one, Texas was good. We passed it early. We were one of the first states to pass it. 
Uh, but it's been a long time coming. Uh, I, I was at the 73 National Municipal Caucus Convention, and that was an important plank. I still remember being right there shoulder to shoulder with Ann Richards uh, when she made this speech in favor of uh, the ERA plank uh, at the International Women's Year Conference. It's one of my favorite photos still. I, we uh, put it on, the, uh, on my Twitter account on Thursday. It's an old black and white, but it still works. Uh, and Dolores, you and I have been there in the battles, not only for women uh, across the board, for, but for the working poor women that work in the fields, that work in the hotels, that work, work in those jobs uh, that don't pay as well. And, and I'm going to be perfectly honest with all of you. Uh, when, I was, when I was beginning this fight and worked with the, the Chicana Caucus, we always just kind of felt that everybody was talking about all this white women stuff and that there wasn't enough about us. Mm. I see some of you are nodding. You know what I'm talking about. Right, so that's sure. Why I'm so glad. I'm so glad that, that, that the movement now, uh, as I saw when you all presented at the Judiciary Committee, uh, is more inclusive. We are beginning to talk about women of color. We're talking about women of color. Right. We're including women of color. We're at the table. We're there to speak up. And that's what we need to do. And I think with Kamala Harris uh, at the table from the beginning at the White House, it's just going to add more passion and more commitment uh, at the White House. Because you just cannot ignore it. And right. Cong not Congresswoman, I, I do want to ask you a question now that sure. you've raised the issue of, I mean, there are so many people who believe that uh, that the ERA is not for women of color. And what do you say when you hear that? What do you say to demonstrate that it is for all of us? Well, first, first, I, I, I tell them of my commitment to it and why I've been fighting, because it's, when you talk about equal pay for equal work, it's not just yeah. for the, uh, the, the white women that work in, in the fancy corporations or in the big management jobs. Is also to make sure that for that, you know, if you are a janitor and that you're there standing next to another janitor that happens to be male, that you are being paid equally, that you are getting the same assignments, and that you are being treated, more importantly, with dignity and respect. Because as I worked with janitors as SEIU organized, it was amazing to me, ladies, to hear the number of complaints that, that I heard about sexual harassment, you know. If the male supervisor, if the women don't become supervisor, it's always the men, then the men will try to get sexual favors in return for better assignments. Uh, and one told me even that uh, if she had not succumbed, if she didn't succumb to the, to the advances of the supervisor, that he was gonna shift, change her to the night shift rather than the day shift. So mm -hmm. when we, you've got to explain it uh, uh, at the level of the position that they have and how it can make a difference. Because the ERA is really going to, to help with sexual harassment cases. It's going to help with equal pay cases. It's going to help across the board. Uh, so I try to just explain it to them uh, based on where they're coming from. Nobody wants to be talked down to or lectured. Nobody wants to be informed. They want to be part of the discussion. Uh, right. So. Uh, so I think Great. that's important in, in approach. Thank uh, but you. I, but I'm going to tell you that 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 poster still works for me. I am going to work my ass off until we get the ERA pass. <laughs> uh, I, I you know I support it as you know Jackie Spears bill. Uh, we passed I, it. Uh, I yeah. think uh, this next White House is going to act on it. Uh, and I think that that you know that's one of my dreams is to live to see a woman president, a woman vice president. And that we get the ERA in the Constitution. So I will, Congresswoman, thank I will you. Keep, I will keep working toward that. Uh, give me a holler on anything, and it's just great to see you all today. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Garcia. It's wonderful that you stopped by. It's like a homecoming, right? You know, it is. Uh, <laughs> I feel like we're having the, the, uh, the, the, the hearing again today. <laughs> Right, great. Well, thank you so much. I am told that uh, Senator Ben Cardin uh, of Maryland has, uh, has arrived. Uh, and uh, as you know, he's the lead sponsor uh, with Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski on SJ Res 6, uh, the bill to remove the time limit on the ERA, which has the support of the full Democratic caucus and two Republicans, Senator Murkowski and Senator Susan Collins. Uh, Senator Cardin, thank you so much for stopping by today. I know you have a very busy schedule. 
Well, Carol, first, thank you very much. I just heard uh, Congresswoman Garcia's uh, comments and uh, right on target. Look, this is a unique convention, so thank you for convening us all on the Equal Rights Amendment. What an historic day, as, as many of us have already acknowledged, the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. Uh, a, a, just a great celebration, but as you all know, it was only three years after uh, women's suffrage that we started the Equal Rights Amendment in the Constitution. So it's been 97 years we've been trying to amend the Constitution to include the Equal Rights Amendment. So we got work still to, to get done. Uh, this is a unique convention. We all know that. We know it's unique because it's virtual, but it's unique because this is the first step in the nomination of Biden-Harris that we reclaim our democracy and we save our democracy. That's Make right. no mistake, I mean, today's theme is that leadership matters. Absolutely, we've got two great leaders that we're gonna be nominating, but elections matter. And when we're talking about getting the Equal Rights Amendment to the finish line, the most consequential thing we can do is elect Joe Biden president of the United States and, and make Chuck Schumer the majority leader of the United States Senate. And if we get that done, I am extremely confident that we're going to be able to get the Equal Rights Amendment finally done. And yes, it is important. It, it, it sets up different standards for judging the, the, the discriminatory activities. And, and as uh, the late Justice Scalia said, certainly the Constitution does not require discrimination on the basis of sex. The only issue is whether it prohibits it, it doesn't. And Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, every Constitution written since the end of World War II includes a provision that men and women are citizens of equal stature. Ours does not the leading democratic state in the world is an outlier in not providing the constitutional protections of the Equal Rights Amendment. It's long overdue to get this done. And yes, we are close to the finish line, but we gotta be realistic. We gotta realize we're not gonna get there uh, with Donald Trump as president, and we're not gonna get there with uh, Mitch McConnell as the majority leader in the United States Senate. So this election is a critically important election. And I'm so proud to be with all of you. You are our champions. You've kept this issue in the forefront of, 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 of American consciousness. Americans are, are learning that our constitution doesn't contain something they thought was in there. Most Americans thought that the Equal Rights Amendment was in the constitution. They now know it's not. And they now know we need to correct it. And we have 38 states that have ratified it. All we need to do is change the time limit and we can get to the finish line. So I'm very proud to be on your team. I look forward to that celebration when the Equal Rights Amendment is finally ratified and we can celebrate the, 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 the 101st anniversary of women's suffrage and the enactment of the Equal Rights Amendment in our Constitution. Thank you all for everything you do. Thank you, Senator Cardin. And we expect to have that big celebration with you soon. I know that you're working very, very hard in the Senate and, and we do need a good election with pro ERA um, candidates uh, swept into office. Uh, so we thank you so much for being, being with us today. I know you have a busy schedule. Thank you for fitting us in as you always do. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, also, we have uh, Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal of the 7th District in Washington State. She's co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, and uh, she was uh, with us and smiling at us in the judiciary hearing that led up to getting the ERA to the full floor of the House and dissolving the time limit. Uh, Congresswoman Jayapal, thanks for being with us today. Carol, thank you so much. I was not just smiling, I was erupting in joy. Um, and so I just wanna say how great it is to be with you and with so many Shiro's who have been really pushing uh, for the ERA for so long. Uh, I don't know if Gloria is on, but you know, Gloria has been an early mentor of mine and you, Carol, uh, giving voice to powerful women. Thank you for seeing us. Dolores Huerta, oh my God, living civil rights icon. And everyone just has to know the legitimate originator of Si Se Puede. Um, yes. <laughs> si Se Puede on ERA. So thank you all so much. And I will never forget that joyful moment together 
um, in the House Judiciary Committee to extend the deadline for ERA ratification. So much of that momentum has been from groups like the ERA Coalition now everyone who's been on the front lines for years asking to constitutionally enshrine gender equality, an idea that was proposed almost a century ago so that parents could not be discriminated against for being pregnant, so that women could not be discriminated against through their paychecks or their fear of sexual harassment. And to win our fight to ratify the ERA, I think it is very important that our movement constantly remind Americans, because I heard what Senator Cardin said, I think there are probably a lot of people who think that this is already enshrined, but we have to do the work to rem remind people that despite our progress, and we've made a lot of progress, the reality for women in the US right now is still bleak. Just think about these numbers, 82, 62, 58, 54. White women make 82 cents on the dollar for a white man, black women 62 cents, native women 58 cents, and Latinas 54 cents. Mm -hmm. And the gender gap is still $10,000 and nearly two thirds of minimum wage workers are women. I heard you starting to talk about this with Sylvia Garcia. Guess what else that means today? It means that our women, and in particular women of color, are bearing the brunt of the COVID-19 crisis. One in three jobs held by women are essential, and non-white women are even more likely to be doing those jobs. It's women and women of color who are caring for the sick in hospitals, ringing up your groceries, running shelters for people experiencing homelessness and domestic violence, driving city buses that transport other workers that we've been calling essential, and yet we have not treated them with the basic dignity and safety of adequate PPE, adequate pay, safe working conditions, and freedom of fear from harassment. So we all know the ways in which sexism and racism permeate our everyday lives. But I just wanna be clear that the insults we face in words, in actions, in the things we are denied in small ways and big ways are directly connected to the fear of our collective power as women. Last month, I joined Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez as we denounced a male colleague who called her a bitch in front of a reporter. And I felt it was critically important on the House floor to connect these kinds of insults, which I and so many of you on the call are intimately familiar with on a personal level, to the concept of power. You see, it's not about right, what they call us, it's about what they want to deny us. The word bitch saw a rise in popularity during 1915 to 1930, and you know why. You all know why. Because in 1920, women got the right to vote, and that threatens the power of all those men out there. So my sisters and siblings, let's not confuse the issue. The fact that we are still fighting to ratify the ERA is because people are afraid of our power. They were afraid of the power of women like Gloria and Dolores, and also of Ida B. Wells and Mary Burrell and Mabel Pingwa Lee and so many more whose fight was really for all of us. So finally passing the ERA will provide women with the additional layer of protections that we need to get the health care that we deserve, the pay we deserve, the protection for all women, including trans people. And as a lifelong feminist and the proud mother of a non-binary child, it is past time. As the great Alice Paul said, the movement is a sort of mosaic. Each one of us puts in one little stone and then you get a great mosaic at the end. So let's launch this final push to ratify the ERA with everything we have and build our mosaic of power, of justice, of equality, so that finally, 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 equal means equal. That's right. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Uh, you are a, an inspiration to us. We watch you in all of your work. You really put fire to the and yes, we do remember AOC's uh, speech on the floor. Uh, gave hope to uh, women and girls everywhere. Thanks so much for being with us and for your continued support. 
Uh, and I remember you when you were a kid, right? No. <laughs> Thank you. I'm still a kid, aren't I? <laughs> I? Yes, you're still a kid. You're still a kid. Thank you. We have also been joined by Senator Tammy Baldwin of Wisconsin, a co-sponsor of SJ Res 6. Uh, and when she was a congresswoman, she sponsors the House bill to remove the time limit. Thank you, Senator Baldwin, for being with us. I think you're you're muted. I am now released from being muted. <laughs> our Great. voices and our visibility are essential. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Thank you so much for being with us and for being a, a very long supporter of the removal of the time limit and for execution of, the, of amending the Constitution. It, it, is, it is an honor to join you and I'm so glad that you are highlighting this conversation uh, as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of women gaining the right to vote, but knowing that our work uh, is still not done. <laughs> right, exactly. Are, are you optimistic at this point? You know, we've, uh, we've been working at this for 100 years. It, may, it feels like that to all of us, but you know, it's a century long effort. But, but are you optimistic that uh, that next year, the 2021 per se, do you see that happening, that the Senate might be able to move forward? You know, I certainly, I think it depends on the outcome of this election. So since we're uh, speaking during a very political week uh, at the Democratic National Convention, you know, I don't think we would see any change from the status quo in the Congress if we don't flip the Senate and we don't elect uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Uh, as our next president and vice president. And um, yet uh, we know because of the action that we have seen in the House of Representatives uh, uh, that there is a lot of hope if we see those changes take place in uh, both the Senate and the White House. Um, and I think that you know now that uh, Virginia became the 38th state, uh, it changes the conversation. Uh, and that there is um, an absolute uh, need to get rid of the, or uh, move beyond the impasse that we're in uh, because of, you know, and I'm sure you've talked about all the techni technicalities here, but the archivist uh, seeking his um, uh, Office of Legal Counsel advice and then stating that he would abide by that, we're at a standstill unless Congress acts. And so, um, I, I think we would see uh, priority placed on this in a Biden-Harris administration and uh, in, a, uh, in a Senate uh, led by uh, uh, Democrats. Right, but e uh, even if it is led by Demo Democrats, wouldn't you need 60 votes? Wouldn't you need some Republicans? Although, I mean, I'm sure you're that optimistic that you will get that many, but you know. <laughs> How, well, how, I'm not sure we'd get 60 in this right. election. I'm certainly right. we're reaching for it, but uh, um, but I think that uh, we have uh, an opportunity then uh, to raise the pressure necessary. Um, and I would certainly hope that we would get, uh, especially um, not to put the burden all on women office holders, but I think that uh, we would get uh, certainly uh, uh, more uh, Republican interest because we now have more women in the United States Senate and uh, of both parties. And I think that um, I think that many of them get exactly what this would mean uh, because uh, you know, by way of example, I think of the professions that led them into public service um, where they have faced the bitterness of uh, discrimination, the harm of discrimination in their own careers, uh, even prior to getting to the United States Senate. Um, and uh, that combined with this movement that is, uh, you know, becoming more and more uh, vibrant and vocal and visible, um, I have hope. I have hope. Well, 
I, we're so glad, and we are so glad to know that you're in the in the leadership of that, along with so many of our other friends and supporters who've joined us uh, in this uh, event today. But Senator Baldwin, thank you so much. Please keep up the good work, and you know, you can see if you can make it a 60. You know, and that uh, oh. the, the, e, the ERA is counting on you. <laughs> with all of your help, oh. <laughs> and I know sure. everyone is working hard. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, you did mention Virginia, and we do have the two legislators who gave us that 38th state who are in the House. I uh, would like to uh, introduce now Virginia State Senator Jennifer McClellan, representing the 9th District of Greater Richmond, and she successfully carried the ERA bill through the Virginia Senate. Thank you so much, Senator McClellan, and thank you for being here today. We know there's a special session going on in Virginia. Thank you, Carol. And I am actually uh, taking a break between committee hearings, so the timing is perfect. Uh, we are in to address the effects of COVID and criminal justice reform. Uh, and so we have a, a judiciary committee that meets shortly. Um, but just wanted, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. okay. Uh, so just wanted to, to take this time to celebrate, um, and it's particularly poetic justice that Virginia was the state to become the 38th state, uh, not only because our, our country was founded here, rep representative democracy was founded here, it's where the first uh, recorded Africans and the first recruited women came, um, but we were on the wrong side of history so many times uh, where slavery began, but it's also where the idea for our constitution began uh, through the Virginia plan, but it didn't include us. And so the fact that we the home of massive resistance uh, became the state that was the 38th state, just was poetic justice. And I couldn't help but think about uh, not just Maggie Walker, uh, Rosa Dixon Bowser, who were some of the suffragettes in Virginia who didn't necessarily get the, the, the credit at the time, but my great grandmother, uh, Elizabeth Campbell Davidson, who uh, watched her husband have to take a literacy test uh, and find three white men to vouch for him uh, one year after the 19th Amendment was ratified and yet she couldn't vote. Um, and so for me to be a member of the uh, Privileges and Elections Committee that the resolution went through, uh, to stand on the Senate floor and say, Madam President, to the first African-American President Pro Tem of the, of the State Senate of Virginia, Louise Lucas, who right now is facing her own trouble as she fights against police brutality uh, and racism here in Virginia and, and was charged with a bogus felony the night before we're coming in the special session, we see we've got a lot of work to do, but we well, are hmm. on our way with the ratification of the ERA. We have already started, Delegate Carol Foy and I, with the Pregnant Worker Fairness Act, putting in bills that would uh, make the ERA not just be an amendment to the Constitution, but uh, do the legislation that we need to make it true. So. It was just a pleasure to take one more step in that in that long fight to make well, life, liberty, and justice for all a reality for all. So thank you for having me here today, and and just I wish we could all be together in person, uh, but it's it's a pleasure to see you even here on the screen. I I know Bettina and I miss you guys. You know we spent so much time in the Richmond Hilton. You know that we. Yeah. But it all worked out. Thank you so much. <laughs> it did. And come on back anytime. <laughs> well, so, also with us today is Virginia Delegate Jennifer Carroll Foy of the Second District, uh, ah, who he who is not here. Uh, so Bettina, can you please tell tell us what we do next? Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Senator McClellan. Okay, great. So now we can go back and my sincere apologies to our dear uh, board uh, chairs uh, that we had to skip because of the press of the uh, electeds walking in. Uh, my apologies. And here we go. Okay. So, as you know, we were beginning to introduce our panelists when all of the elected officials began coming in, and we knew that we would have to make some adjustment for that. So my sincere apologies to the board chairs of the ERA Coalition and the Fund for Women's Equality. But introducing first Kimberly Peeler Allen, political analyst, co-founder of Higher Heights, and uh, which is dedicated to electing black women, you can tell 
you know, she's very popular these days that all of these uh, developments are happening. Uh, and she's also board chair of the ERA coalition, just recently elected. We're so proud to have her as our chair, Kimberly. There we go. Thank you, Thank you so much, Carol. It is um, such a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I will uh, gladly uh, step back for our elected leaders who are really uh, doing so much of the important work to advance the ERA. And uh, I'm joined the ERA coalition several years ago as a board member and then stepped up to uh, run for chair because I really see this as uh, the necessary piece of the puzzle to make sure that all of the all of the the bills and uh, acts that we have had to put in place across this country whether it is at the state level or at the federal level uh, we need something we need it codified in the constitution that there cannot be discrimination based on sex and we've had various bills here and there that have have done this but they've had to be renewed and if we can get it into the constitution it is just the law of the land that now is enforceable uh, and i think that is something that is um, has been missing and as I have been fighting to elevate the voices of black women into all spaces so that we can really stand in our own leadership, being part of this process to make sure not just black women and women of color, but women overall, non-binary individuals have the opportunity to reach their fullest potential to stand in their collective power and have their voices heard. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and to be part of this conversation and we have done we have moved so far since the 19th amendment was passed but we still have so much work so much more work to be done and with all of you here all of you watching in your homes or wherever you are in the, in this country right now together we can make sure that equality really is for everyone so thank you so much Thank you, Kimberly, very much. We're so glad to have you on board. Mona Sinha, who is the board chair of the philanthropic organization Women Moving Millions, and she's also board chair of the ERA Coalition sister organization, the Fund for Women's Equality. Mona, thanks. Thank you, Carol. It's such an honor to be here in this very esteemed company and see many familiar faces. As someone who was adopted by this country and who adopted it as my own country 35 years ago, it's been a real honor um, and I believe in equality for all. The ERA was my American dream, it still is our American dream and it has to become a constitutional right. There's just no more discussion about it. It's 2020, it's high time this happened. 100 years is just a little too long. So thank you, I'm privileged to have this leadership role. I'm two weeks in. So I'm learning and listening and working with all of you and very proud to be here. Well, thank you so much, Mona. We're, we're glad, to, glad to have you, that we were able to kidnap you. I've been serving on our board for a while and we finally convinced you to take a leadership role. We are now, as I started to say before, now joined by Jennifer Carroll Foy of the second district uh, in Virginia. Uh, and uh, Jennifer Carroll Foy, delegate, uh, carried that bill, the ERA bill across the, the House floor, gave us a 38th state, you and Jennifer McClellan. Uh, please, thank you for stopping by. I know you're in special session and that's why you've been coming and going. Yes, thank you so much for having me. And yes, we're in between uh, our business and so I couldn't miss this. I wouldn't miss this for the world uh, to say hi to all that activists and the organizations and everyone who's been working so hard. So I'm Delegate Virginia Delegate Jennifer Carroll Foy. And when I joined forces with the ERA Coalition, Feminist Majority, VA Ratified ERA and others, um, two years ago, um, I can tell you that we led the fight to pass the Equal Rights Amendment this last January here in Virginia to make us the 38th and final state needed for ratification because only when we have a constitutional amendment to support our laws will we see real progress. Then we know our rights can't be taken, our fate won't depend upon an election, our freedoms cannot be stripped away at whim. At whim. And we are here to agitate for equality, to disrupt the status quo, to fight fearlessly for change. And so I'm just so excited to work with all of you and to help Biden and Kamala get elected for us to flip the Senate to keep Congress because we need to do everything that we can to ensure that women's equality 
is paramount and it's definitely on the ballot on November, on November 3rd. So I'm excited to do my part um, to help uh, pro-equality candidates get elected from coast to coast because that's what's important. What I'm excited about is the fact that women are doing pretty well, but we have yet to unlock our full potential and we have yet to see the true possibilities of what women can do when we are allowed to really excel. So it's not just about having the Equal Rights Amendment, which will address pay equity and ending sex discrimination, but it's also about bills that I'm carrying and other people are supporting and carrying also, such as pay family medical leave and talking about economic equality um, and pay transparency. I mean, these are the things that's important, a bill to end pregnancy discrimination, make breast milk covered uh, by insurance and make childcare affordable. These are the things we have to do. We have to take a holistic approach when we're talking about uh, making this climate better for women and girls everywhere. Because what we do, 165 million women and girls are watching and waiting for their full constitutional equality. So I'm so excited to be working with all of you and doing all that we can to ensure we have full ratification of the ERA. And as I always like to say, there's only one way to spell equality, and that's E R A. So we love you. it. We love it. Thank you so much, Delegate Carol Foy. Uh, I, we appreciate it so much. Uh, and again, uh, they were in special session in Richmond, and they've come out. They were champions to get. Uh, that 38th state for us, and we're so, so appreciative. We also have uh, in the House uh, now, uh, Congresswoman Jackie Speer, who represents the 14th district in California. She was the lead sponsor of HJ Res 79, which as we all know, passed the House on February 13th of 2020. We like to put these numbers out with a vote of 232 to 183. Congresswoman Speer, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Carol. I look across this gallery and I see all the powerful women that I feel so privileged to be associated with. Thank you, um, each and every one of you. Uh, you are our true gems. You know, today we are celebrating um, Harry Byrne. Do we all know who Harry Byrne is? Harry Byrne was the anti-suffragist who wore a red rose in the Tennessee uh, state legislature and was going to vote against the um, the right to give women the vote, except that day he received a letter from his mother, Phoebe, <laughs> who said, you must vote for it. And it was because of Harry Byrne that it was passed in the Tennessee legislature today, a hundred years ago. So for the Harry Burns of tomorrow, <laughs> <laughs> For all of those men that we're going to uh, challenge on the Senate side to make sure that um, they take the action up on the extension of the, uh, the striking of the deadline on the ERA, HJ Res 79. I saw a number of my colleagues uh, who are, have joined. I saw Congresswoman Garcia and Jayapal and Moore and um, all our powerful um, sisters. And uh, I can't say enough about Ellie Smeal, who's been in this battle forever, and um, Elisa Milano, Tina Chen, uh, to State Senator Spearman for all the work you've done, Dolores Ware. I, I mean, I look really, I'm, I'm dumbfounded <laughs> by what I see, but um, we are here to talk about how we get it over the finish line. I don't know if we want to spend any more energy trying to get the Senate to take it up. We've got to be prepared in January to take it up. I've already had a conversation with Vice President Biden. Um, it's on his radar screen. I told him um, that in the first 100 days, these are the things you need to do for women. And um, getting the ERA passed um, is one of them. So um, we've got to remember what Antonin Scalia said. Certainly the Constitution does not require discrimination based on sex. The only question is, does it prohibit it? It does not. So uh, for Peggy Young at UPS, for um, all the other women, Christy Brunzgala from uh, the university who was raped, for Jessica Gonzalez who um, lost her three children because the police didn't enforce a restraining order, 
uh, for Lola Kuba, who worked at Allstate Insurance and was underpaid, um, for all of these women, and for all of our daughters and granddaughters. I mean, it's time. Pregnancy discrimination continues in this country. We know it. Um, and we know that equal pay it is still aspirational, and we've got to fix that. Um, but there's so very much more. I, I just want to end with this sweet story. I talked to a young student in my district yesterday who wants to do a pilot project in my district and provide uh, tampons and sanitary napkins to all the girls in her school and all the schools in the district. And I thought, you know, that's part of the next generation. Tampax and sanitary napkins are like toilet paper, for goodness sakes. When are we going to recognize that, you know, many of these issues um, right. still plague us? And for a young 17-year-old to say, this, this, we really want to fix this, says to me that we have another generation of bright, capable young women that are here for the fight with us. And we must do everything to make sure that it is finally, after 97 years, 98 years, after Alice Paul in 1923 put it before the Congress, that this time we do something about it. So thank you, Carol, and everyone for uh, being on this call. Thank you, Congresswoman. And thank you so much for speaking into the ear of uh, Vice President Biden. Uh, uh, to, to, to take it up early. Uh, should there be the Biden-Harris administration? We thank you so much for your, you know, for your leadership and, th and for stopping by today. I know you have a busy schedule. Uh, I'm going to say the Postal Service now. <laughs> ah, great. We're, all, we're, you're, we're hopeful. <laughs> thank you so much, Congressman Spear. We're going to take a quick look at a video. I'm sure many of you, uh, as we know, celebrating the uh, the centennial of the women's vote and PBS did a wonderful series, uh, two nights. Uh, Ellie uh, Smeal was in it. Uh, many people uh, in our group were, were uh, in it, got to speak in it. And uh, they did a mini doc about the ERA that didn't air then, but ran on the web. And I want to play just a little snippet of bringing up the, uh, the history of the ERA to the current day. Let's take a look at that now. Now, over three decades later, as the number of women in Congress and state houses reaches a record high, a new generation is reviving the ERA. There is only one way to spell equality, and that is simply E -R -A. Women in the Nevada, Illinois, and Virginia legislatures are leading the fight. In the wake of the Me Too movement and the fight for equal pay, the ERA came back to life. Democrats in Congress are pushing for its addition to the Constitution. The House of Representatives voted to remove the 1982 deadline. But Senate Republicans and the Trump administration remain opposed. And there's also the question of the five states that have tried to rescind their ratifications of the amendment. Ongoing litigation makes it unclear when or if it will be added. Today, a century after the ERA was first conceived, it continues to hang in limbo. Over the decades, women have made gains through other changes in laws and policies. But the need for ratification remains for many of the women at the center of the struggle now, as a way to recognize the work that's come before and to ensure women's rights going forward. When you enshrine my constitutional rights as a human being equal to men, well, that is the only thing that's acceptable. Persistence, faith, and hope fuel the indomitable spirit of this movement. We got tired, but we did not faint. We became weary, but we did not stop. History demands that we take a stand. The struggle continues and the work is not done.
And you may have seen me and Bettina that I was calling to, as we do at the ERA Coalition all the time. Bettina, what's next? Uh, she's our DC director and director of outreach uh, and helping to escort our guests in and out of our room. It's been you know, so exciting to see so many. Uh, I do want to give a reminder, though, uh, to please share your thoughts on social media with the hashtag electing quality. Uh, and if so moved, you may donate by texting the word vote to the numbers 243725, 243725. And uh, you can do that now during the program and afterwards as well. The program, I'm reminding everyone, is being recorded. It will be available on Facebook uh, and YouTube. And uh, that closed captioning is available by clicking on the window at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and uh, those are our housekeeping detail reminders. And now we're going to, going to try to resume our program a bit. So exciting to have, to have so many guests. Uh, but I think that we're going to uh, begin a conversation uh, with Ellie Ismail, uh, Tina Chen, and Dolores Huerta, can you ask for a better conversation than, than that? Uh, talking about their reactions to what we've heard so far, uh, it seems to me to be very encouraging. Uh, and so, uh, Tina, I'll start with you uh, as the uh, intern working on the ERA between college and law school. Uh, your reaction to what you've heard so far today from our elected officials. Well, it's so great to see. I mean, I will tell you, you know, Illinois, we did not pass it in 1981. Um, and it was 40 years later that, you know, we finally, in this new resurgence, Illinois finally did. And we were happy to be one of those final three states to get to 38. Um, you know, Ellie, we never thought it would happen back then. <laughs> it was, and and it, it was such a moment back then just to see the energy and actually and i experienced it at a very young age the disappointment and the frustration um when it did when it didn't happen um so to now see in this current moment when it is so important i think to recognize and empower women you know we're just seeing a transformational moment i think across the nation on so many issues and you know, I'm feeling it in my work today that we need this moment, to use this moment to really transform and elevate and empower women, women of color, transgender women, you know, everyone across the board needing to step into their power um, and to recognize you know, the equal rights that we have so long deserved. And you know, to some of the questions I've been seeing in, in the Q&A, you know, what, why now? What is the difference? We have the 14th Amendment, but quite frankly, the last three years have taught us how fragile all of those gains are without a constitutional explicit protection of equal rights under the law, right? I mean, you know, we're seeing the chip, slow chipping away in the judicial process. We know that Mitch McConnell has succeeded in his goal of filling all the vacancies that he would not let President Obama fill during our administration so that the courts are no longer a place where we can expect justice under the law to be done under the 14th Amendment. So now it is more critical than ever, right, than ever because of the way the courts have shifted to make sure that equal rights under the law based upon gender is enshrined in the Constitution because otherwise, even, even in a bit by Harris administration, as cases move their way, we know the right will continue to push their cases through since they control the courts, and they will even if we succeed in November. Um, it is so important now that we make sure we have those constitutional rights in charge. I never thought I would say this at age 64 that I am now, having been doing this when I was 22, but here we are again, again doing this. And I have to, just before I stop talking, again, Carol, I just need to say, first of all, to Ellie and to Dolores, who you're going to turn to next, these are the two women who paved the way, who continue to set an example for all of us with their incredible leadership, their energy. If any of you have seen Dolores Huerta, like fire up a room, no one else does it the way Dolores Huerta does because she fires all of us and inspires right. all of us. And I want to personally thank you both for being two of the people who have really molded me into the person I am today and the leader that I hope I am today following in your footsteps. So thank you to both of you. Yeah, thank you. And, and it, when they say what's different, you know, we have this pandemic, right? But 
what it does is it exposes all the injustices. We keep talking about the low pay of women, but we see now they are calling us essential workers. Those very women, uh, and many of them are people of color, uh, are are now getting their just due that yes, they are essential workers and they're not being paid reasonably. In fact, women are something like 52% of the essential workers in this country and over 70%, actually over uh, three fourths of the uh, hospital workers. And by the way, have been the something like 75% uh, of the people who got coronavirus from hospital work are women and especially women of color. Uh, but so what does that mean? They're they're being low. They're low paid. They're being cheated, and they're they're they were never valued properly. One of the things we've got to do, as you know, is end sexism and racism. And the Equal Rights Amendment will help in just a great deal. We just can't take no for the answer. We're so close, and you know, and I know that in Illinois we were in the majority. We had overwhelming support not just a little support. Every day we had another demonstration of thousands of people. You know, it, it was incredible. What is hold, was holding it back was the power of big business, the power of the insurance industry, the power of those who make money out of pay, taking advantage of people. And, and basically, we have got to not only expose that power, we just got to flip that Senate because they're still standing in the way. They're not, you know, they don't yield. They'll put every kind of phony argument up there. The real argument has been money. And, and it, what I'm really surprised, Gloria Stein and myself wrote an op-ed talking about the money interest. And people thanked us. They didn't realize there was power interest against us because so much has been made of the phony fight between women. That's not the issue. The issue was there's people of power. And I think that this is going to be a real change election because the virus has not only caused such tragic and death and suffering, it has exposed those forces. And I think that people um, are going to demand change. That's, that's what we got. And we got to make sure that happens. We got one more fight. Um, Dolores, you're ready for the fight, aren't you? Is she there? Hey, I'm here. Good. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I'm okay. sure you're ready for the fight. Uh, yeah, and I think that's what we have to do. Uh, you know, women, we have been victims for so long at so many different levels. And when we think that we are such great contributors to the economy, you know, we kind of make a, this whole capitalistic system work. And yet we are so degraded and so disrespected uh, by all of these different uh, financial institutions. And when we think about that, we think, well, we do so much and yet why, why are we not even respected or, or honored for, the, for everything that we do? But I think instead of getting sad, we need to get mad, okay? <laughs> we need to get mad. And so we have to do everything that we can to make sure uh, that the ERA is ratified in, in the Senate. And you know, when they're talking about the Senate right now, I'm thinking right now, here we have all of these families that have been affected by the pandemic, all the numbers of, of people that are not working right now, and where's the Senate? They're gone. They took a vacation. I mean, this is so outrageous, you know? And this is what we as women have to do. We have to just raise our voices. Uh, we have to raise our voices because we do need more women in leadership. We know that. And uh, this is one of the ways that we can make that happen is by making sure that the ERA uh, is ratified and, and approved. And when we talk about women, it's not just women here in the United States. We can think of women in Africa. We can think of women in Latin America. We can think of all of the places that women are oppressed, you know. And uh, this is what this means. It, this is going to be, uh, you might say, our banner. It's going to be our shield. It's going to protect us. Uh, but it's also going to be our armor and our weapon, which will give us just more ammunition to go out there and say, we as women need to be treated equally in all in all places, in all places, in education, you know, in, in, in our public offices, everywhere where we as women need to be. One of the interesting things now when we talk about the pandemic, that in the places that we've had women in leadership, in government, we have seen 
that that is the places where sheltering has worked better, masking has worked better. And we have so many examples why women need to be leaders in our country. And the ERA is one way that we can make it happen. You know, when you said, Tina, that you were 64 years old, just imagine this thing has eaten up three or four generations because you started as, what did you, did you say, 21? I was 22. 22. <laughs> First but and, and and I gotta tell you, you've made a help. You helped a lot of women when you were in the White House, as you well know, and you still are. So one of the things this movement's doing is that it's keeping us strong, and so making sure that we keep on uh, keeping. On. <laughs> but I would like to finish this one because too many women have been taken advantage of for too long, and too many people. I mean, I want to. I think it's good that our language is inclusive because in fact, this will help all people, let's be real. And it will, I think, uh, what do you think as the lawyer on the decision of the Supreme Court, it's clear that it's gonna help people uh, with or, uh, sexual identity and sexual orientation, the LGBTQIA community. So, I mean, we just gotta get this done. Yeah, no, when we put, you know, that what that Supreme Court decision from a couple of months ago, you know, just tells us is that that same language will be interpreted to protect transgender, you know, um, uh, folks. And, you know, we know we've seen as much as everything we try to do uh, for transgender soldiers, for transgender students in the Obama administration got undone, got completely unwound in the last three years. Um, if there was a constitutional protection against discrimination, it would have been impossible even for a Trump administration to do that unwinding. Um, and you know, that just demonstrates why you know, what, we, what we are able to do legislatively or by policy, even the many things that we tried to do during our eight years in the White House, if you don't have that fundamental bedrock constitutional right explicitly made, it all can go away from administration to administration. You know? And working families can't afford that. Right now we're seeing the loss of health care, the loss of contraception, you know, what's happening to women who work in hospitals run by religious institutions or companies like Hobby Lobby who can't, yeah. right? They're, you know, the access to contraceptive care that we've tried to put into the Affordable Care Act for them by legislation. This, you know, all of these things, the sweep of it, and, you know, um, on what we could get protected, the things that we have to fight battle by battle by battle, which I learned from you, Ellie, and from you, Dolores, you know, those are the things that we need that constitutional amendment to really provide our protections from, you know, really the fragility of the rights that we have right now. Um, and, and I do think young women are seeing it. You know, I think a lot of what has happened, um, you know, like General Carroll for, you know, we're seeing young women and young women leaders take up the banner, which is so exciting. Young women of color, um, really understanding what they need. Black women seeing the connection between sexism and racism, how, you know, the patriarchy and racial, you know, um, injustice are all coming from the same place. And the ERA is just one of those really key building blocks to knocking that down. That's right. Well, Absolutely. I want to thank, thank you all. What a, what a terrific uh, exploration uh, from, the, from your various uh, significant historical uh, viewpoints. We want to thank you so much. Uh, uh, we've mentioned several times the vote uh, in the House that dissolved the time limit. Uh, we have a brief uh, uh, soundbite we want you to hear from Jan Chikowsky. Uh, uh, an Illinois Congresswoman. Let's go to that right now. Every single constitution in the whole world written since 1959, including Afghanistan, for example, has the equivalent of the Equal Rights Amendment, but the United States of America does not. Though my colleagues on the other side of the aisle and President Trump's Department of Justice may tell you otherwise, we need the Equal Rights Amendment and we need it now. The requisite number of states have now voted to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. Last year, my home state of Illinois was the 37th state to ratify, and this year, Virginia brought us to that number of 38. 
And today, I will proudly vote yes to show my grandchildren, my granddaughters, and my grandsons that women are not only strong and powerful and resilient, but also equal citizens under the law. Wow. So powerful words, uh, and we're now living in a time of pandemic uh, as we all try to get through this uh, lockdown. Uh, over 5 million cases, over 170,000 lost souls. Uh, we see so much more clearly the devastation in women's lives. And what would the adoption of the ERA in the Constitution mean for that? Nevada State Senator Pat Spearman and Dolores Ware to tackle that one for us. Well, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we have seen when we have had women uh, in leadership and government and diff as different governors uh, that actually the cases of COVID-19 have not been as bad as in other places. Uh, so women leadership, they've been able to stand up, uh, you might say, stand up to, to COVID-19. They've been able to stand up to the pandemic. And I think the reason when we think of women in leadership, because we know as women, we just generally have more compassion uh, we, we have more caring. I always like to say that, uh, and I like to quote Curtis Scott King, who said that uh, we will never have peace in the world until women take power. And I do really do believe that because I think there's not any woman that wants to see a brother, a son, a husband, anybody in their family killed. And so if we can look forward to that vision of that day uh, when we would have a world without domination, uh, where it is not just profit driven, uh, where we would have a world where people would share intelligence and, and, and trade and everything else, then we could stop a lot of, of the terrible things that happen on our planet. And especially now, when we know that our planet is, uh, is, is threatened by global warming. And, uh, and, and I, I do want to say too, I want to just give a shout out to thank of all of the women that have marched and all of the women's marches uh, to all of these young women that we have in leadership, like uh, Emma Gonzalez from Florida that have been marching against guns, uh, like Greta from Germany that has been, you know, taking the lead on climate change. Jane Fonda, who has been having her fire drill Friday every Friday, and she has reached over 2 million people. We know when we have women in leadership, great things happen. And so this is what the ERA will do. It will help us get more and more women in leadership and give, give that inspiration to all of those young women out there who sometimes have self-doubts because of the chauvinism that we have in our society. And they will know that this world belongs to them also. Thank you, Dolores. Pat, I know you. this has been a concern of yours. We've talked about this throughout the months. Yeah. You know, so um, I'll say I want to um, piggyback on what uh, uh, Ms. Dolores just said. This. We keep talking about a pandemic. Um, and in Nevada, we just completed two special sessions. And I was very intentional in each one of those special sessions to say it is not a pandemic, but it is a dual pandemic. George Floyd's murder opened the curtain for the world to see the injustices and the inequities that we were already experiencing in the African-American community in, in, in Black, Indigenous, and people of color. In, in our communities, these inequities have been forever. The reason I started out uh, talking about paying homage to my great-grandmothers and to my mother and to all of the women who have gone before us is because at this moment in history, I, I want to adopt what Fannie Lou Hamer said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And so working to get this done is really a matter of addressing the dual pandemics that we have. Last Thursday, August the 13th, was Pay Equality Day for African American women. In other words, August the 13th was the day plus all of the months of 2019 that's how long it took for black women to make as much as white men did in one year. That ought to outrage us. It ought to infuriate us. And it should also animate us to know that our work
is not done. When we talk about what COVID-19 has done and why we need the ERA, it's because we have to enlighten everybody so that they understand, yes, we are trying, we tried to form a more perfect union, but we are not perfect yet. And it's as former President Obama said, we are becoming perfected. And the ERA is one of those ways that we can become more perfected with respect to pay equity. More respected, more, more, more perfected in terms of what happens in the criminal justice system. More perfected in terms of housing. When we look at the housing crisis here in America, we look at it and paint it with a very broad brush but do we not understand that about 72% of the people that are homeless are women, single parent women who are heads of households? That ought to infuriate us and it ought to animate us. When we stop and we think about black women going into medical situations and then concerns being discounted, when I introduced and we passed it uh, in, in Nevada, Senate Concurrent Resolution 1, and I would encourage all of my state legislators who are on this call to please look at that. Senate Concurrent Resolution 1 said that structural racism is declared to be a public health crisis. That's important because my sister, one of my younger sisters, December of 2016, called me about 10 o'clock, it was on Eastern time, and <clears throat> I had just gotten to DC on my way to an um, event with Victory Fund. And she said, Patty, she said, you know, I've been, my stomach's been hurting for a long time. I said, baby, go to, go to the e emergency room. She said, well, I wanted to, I called my doctor and he said, well, just wait a minute. So she called me back in an hour, I said, get to the emergency room. My niece, my nieces took her to the emergency room. She got there about one o'clock in the morning and she sat in the emergency room on one of those gurneys until five o'clock in the morning when the doctor came in and she told the doctor, my stomach has been hurting over here and the pain is getting worse. And the doctor, she said, my niece said, the doctor stayed in there about 10 minutes, 10 minutes. She's been there for four hours walked out of the room, sent the nurse back in and said, well, you know, it's probably just some type of upset stomach. So come back and see me on Monday, five o'clock in the morning on Saturday, four o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, Sunday, she was dead. Wow. You talk about COVID-19 and what that means in terms of a dual pandemic and what the ERA would mean for women, there's no doubt in my mind that if my sister had been white and rich with her own private insurance instead of Medicaid, she would have celebrated her 58th, uh, her 58th birthday last year, but instead she's dead. That's only one person that I know of right now, but how many hundreds of thousands have been impacted by this? So when people say to me that, you know, time, it, it, the time is out for the ERA, it's old and we don't need to do anything about it. I say, you can miss me on that, okay? You can miss me on that because it will not be outdated until equality comes in every form, economic equality, medical equality, equality, when we talk about housing, when we talk about professionalism, the ERA and this COVID-19 part of this dual pandemic, walk side by side in history. And until we make the Equal Rights Amendment a part of the US Constitution, we will never be able to rest because someone else, someone else's sister, someone else's mother, someone else's grandmother could be on their way to the hospital right now and they need the medical profession, a male doctor who walks into that room to recognize they are hurting and their needs and their concerns must be addressed. Senator, Senator Spearman, thank you. we get it done. Yeah, thank you. Such a, you can see why we got the, uh, uh, the state of Nevada uh, to ratify the ERA and so pleased that you and Dolores Huerta are, are in the leadership, uh, we, it, you give us confidence that we can get this done. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll have to do this again because as we know, you're 
life story and all the way you tell the stories is so 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 powerful but you bring up the structural uh racism uh the mental health issues that which leads us right to a discussion of systemic racism and economic justice and in conversation we'll have kimberly peeler allen and mona sinha from the era coalition and fund for women's equality but i do want to start with a video from the great shirley chisholm let's take Listen to that before Mona and Kimberly begin talking. Blacks and women in this country had been marching and boycotting and lobbying and pamphleting for the basic rights of citizenship. You must remember that when the Constitution was written, that women were regarded as property and that blacks were only regarded as three-fifths of a person. So one could understand how it is that blacks and women are still struggling to gain equitability of opportunity across the board in jobs, in education, and in training. There is no particular test as yet that indicates that man has a superiority of gray cranial matter over women. One of my all-time favorite, all-time favorite uh, quotes from Shirley Chisholm. Kimberly, do you want to lead off with Mona? Uh, I just adore Shirley Chisholm. She is my personal patron saint. Uh, and uh, she just has, has laid bare just so much of what needs to be done and what can what she did and what needs to be carried forward from you know the the speeches that she made in 1968 when she was first uh uh running for congress to where we are now the 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 challenges are the same uh what i think um so many of the panelists have already shared is the sense of urgency in this moment and the need for us to really look at the era and all of our justice movements as intersectional movements that we cannot bifurcate our ourselves from being women or being people of color or being farm workers or or being uh, for, formally un, uh, unhoused. Uh, we have to look at the totality of our experience and make sure that as we are fighting for equality, all of those pieces are in place. Otherwise, it is a completely hollow victory. And we know that the, the text of the, ER, the Equal Rights Amendment is uh, very broad and can you know, lead to a lot of interpretation. So it is important for us to take that, that broadness and really fill in the gaps so that everyone sees themselves as part of this movement, whether it is racial justice, gender justice, uh, all of the pieces and particularly the things that are just so pressing right now uh, that we have to really work to make sure that we have more women of color, we have more voices of color, we have more young women, we have more uh, trans women, uh, n gender non-binary individuals as part of this movement so that we can make sure that we don't leave anyone behind because we know whether it is from a leadership perspective, whether it is uh, just the engagement of our citizenry. When we have more voices that are part of this process, it will be better for everyone. So it is, um, you know, we just need to continue to grow and continue to talk to as many people about as possible about the impact of the Equal Rights Amendment, whether it is uh, being a, a piece of the puzzle to move uh, more women who are women of color who are disproportionately in our pr criminal justice system, system uh, by doing com co uh, combining with others to make sure that we are uh, eliminating cash bail uh, because that is a barrier for so many women of color and, and disproportionately uh, uh, hurts communities of color. Just looking at all of these various barriers, whether pay equity, we've talked about the essential workers uh, and 
housing and, and opportunity to really thrive, uh, that we really just need to continue. We can't be myopic and think in the, in the frame of women just being, meaning the white normative, uh, but really women as being all of us uh, for us to really be able to move forward. Yeah, Kim, uh, Kimberly and Mona, we've just been joined by Congresswoman Deb Holland, and I think she, she would like to, would fit right in this conversation. Uh, she represents the first district of New Mexico. She's one of the first of two Native American women in Congress. Sharice Davids is the other. Uh, Congresswoman Holland is a member of the Laguna Pueblo people. And thank you so much, Congresswoman, for being with us. We're just in the middle of a discussion uh, about racism, uh, women of color, uh, your thoughts on that and the, and the Equal Rights Amendment. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I've been watching for a while and uh, what a wonderful, thank you, a wonderful group of women. I'm always so proud to be on the same anything with Dolores Huerta, <laughs> who is my, uh, my mentor and um, I, I miss marching in the parade with you this year, and hopefully we will be able to do that uh, next year. Uh, but thank you all so much for all of your hard work, for everything that you're doing. Um, yes, this is the most important thing. I mean, look, we've been fighting for this since I was a kid, I think, right? <laughs> Uh, I mean, when do we finally stop uh, the fight and enjoy, you know, the, you know, the, the uh, benefits of what we have sown um, as one of the first two Native American women in Congress after 230 some odd years? Um, you know, it really does seem like we wait a very long time for a lot of things, but we can't ever stop fighting. You know, the generations that come behind us, they are, they are going to reap what, what we have sown. So I know that some of you who have been on the front lines for a lot longer than I have, uh, perhaps, you know, you feel like it's time to hand this off to the next generation. Just know that everything that you do, um, so many of us appreciate and, and we love you, absolutely love you for it. So. So thank you, thank you. And I feel like this is such a perfect day uh, to be here talking about uh, the passing of the Equal Rights Amendment with today marking the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, why I'm wearing white, uh, giving women the right to vote. And of course, we're reminded of the power uh, of that vote, including the power to bring equality, the power to elected leaders who care about women and opportunities, about equal pay, about reproductive justice, and to sexual discrimination, and all of those things. Everything that we know comes with representation. Um, I love that clip by Shirley Chisholm that you just showed. Um, representation is so, so important. Um, and, I, and as you know, we're all here um, because we are, we want to see the first woman vice president elected uh, to our country. How exciting is that? I, I feel so, uh, so blessed that I get to sit here. I was on a panel the other day with, um, I think it was Mayor Breed from San Francisco, and she said uh, her nephew uh, piped up one day and uh, looked to his mom and said, Mom, can boys be mayors, <laughs> right? I mean, that's a world, that's an amazing world that we're bringing our kids up in now, uh, that, that we are showing the way. And there's only one way that we're going to uh, be able to work on all these issues that we're talking about the, today, and that's to make sure that we have representation. Uh, it's women, we're still only 25% or less than 25% of the Congress. Uh, we need to get it to at least 50%. Uh, we need people from all walks of life. You know, some of me and my colleagues, after we had that big influx of women in 2018, and a lot of people say, oh, it's the year of the woman. Well, no, we don't just get one year. We're going to have a decade <laughs> of the woman, and we're going to have, 
many years of the woman, but we can, uh, some of me and my friends kind of joked in Congress that we just lowered the, you know, the net worth of, of the net of, you know, collectively because all of us are just regular people. You know, none of us had savings accounts when we decided to run for Congress. We just felt like we needed to do that for the people that we love and care for. So, um, so I'm just, I'm so honored to be here with all of you. Thank you for dedicating so much time and effort to everything you do. Um, uh, State Delegate um, Jennifer Carol Foy, uh, you're just so amazing and it's so nice to see you again. Um, and I'll tell you that one of the things I know that we absolutely need to do is just make sure that we keep um, keep on these issues. Women of color still face, you know, large amounts of injustice with pay inequity. I think just last week it was African American Women's Equal Pay Day, right? It takes them that long to catch up to white males. Um, there's a lot of work left to do. Uh, as co-chair of Women Lead at the DCCC, I work with Lois Frankel and Congresswoman Robin Kelly, uh, we're working t tirelessly around the clock to make sure that we're raising the money that women need to run and win their elections. And um, I mean, look, we need people at the table. Uh, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. We need more women at the table. We need more women to win their elections. Um, and so all of us, you know, we're ready to see that happen and, and you know, to keep inspiring um, you know, folks to follow in our footsteps. One of the things I said when I won my election was I'm going to leave the ladder down. I'm going to leave the ladder down. This year, uh, I had Native women calling me from all over the country, running for state legislatures and city councils and, and things like that. I was really proud that in Kansas of all states, all four Native women who ran for seats um, in Kansas uh, elections, they won, including the first transgender woman, Native American woman in Kansas. So we're Fantastic. making progress. Uh, we just have to keep keep working hard. Great. Well, Congresswoman Holland, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, you know, your your presence gives gives us hope. And thanks for leaving the ladder down. That's something that we should remember. Another thing we'll take away from our conversation today. Thanks so much. Nice Mona, to see you all. Thank you. Thank Mona, you. Back to you. We stand on the shoulders of so many of you, and we do this for the next generation, as you said. Representation does matter. And just, you know, seeing Senator Harris being picked as the next potential vice president of this country makes all of us feel valuable um, and our children see ourselves in her as well. So thank you for everything that you do. So my tenure as a board chair of the ARA Fund for Women's Equality has just begun. It, two weeks ago is when I took on this role. Um, although I have been fighting for women's rights and economic justice all my life. But this is an urgent time for us. And even today, as has been acknowledged, we celebrate the passage of suffrage 100 years ago, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and 100 years ago, just to put it in context, white women gained valuable rights, but many were left out of the room. And today, I think we need to lead with more inclusive values and create what I would love to um, build upon um, as a feminist future. So in every religion, I grew up in Hindu in India, we're told that we're created equal as men and women in the eyes of God. And it's shocking to me that in the United States, we're not created equal in our own constitution. So it's, it's been said before, but the US is only one of 28 countries out of 195 that doesn't guarantee equal rights for men and women. Even Afghanistan guarantees that right. As we've heard from other panelists, from Kimberly, from Ellie, um, Senator Spearman, every single person has had their moment of reckoning during this time. Um, COVID-19 has showed us that race has become a comorbidity. Um, it's as bad as having diabetes or having another a heart disease. Um, and this pandemic has really exposed how discriminatory the impact has been uh, on our society. Our healthcare system, our educational distance learning system, which has affected my two children who can't go to college anymore, our system of protecting our frontline workers, They've all failed, basically, let's just say it. 
basic rights and basic systems of survival have been demolished. Um, women of color have struggled to keep food on the table and stay healthy. And it's just, you know, to me, it's unacceptable that we are in this position as the United States, which, as I mentioned, as an immigrant, for me, was a land of great hope. Yeah. So you might ask, what does a feminist future look like? What do we mean? And frankly, we have some great examples in the world, because if we stop and take a look and see what there is out there, we can see it. First step is, of course, to get the Equal Rights Amendment into our constitution so that equality is never again a question or it's never doubted. You know, we have the right to carry a gun. I think we can demand the right to be equal regardless of the gender we're born in or choose to live as, right? Um, and once we have that going, let's define, redefine the framework and, um, and really hone in on the clarity that we've received over these past seven months. Um, and if we look across the globe, look at the countries that have had success in controlling this virus, and it's no surprise. Oh, Who leads them? Exactly. So Germany, led by Angela Merkel. New Zealand, led by Jacinda Ardern. Finland, led by a 34-year-old young young prime minister, Taiwan, you know, in Asia, um, and Iceland. And if you go back and say, why were these women successful? You know, they used the tactics of collaboration, empathy, patience, strength, and they listened. And they listened and then they took action. And they implemented policies, they implemented testing, contact tracing, isolation measures as a health imperative, not as a political statement, which is what we've done in this country. And finally, there's no reason to stop there. We can start looking at many sectors of our society and, um, and see where we can implement some of, these, some of these behaviors and futures. So in the corporate world, I grew up in the corporate world on Wall Street, and we were rewarded for exhibiting very masculine traits, you know, being aggressive, being in control, mm -hmm. winning, you know, all the sports analogies that we constantly used and you know, getting the deal and touching base and all this kind of stuff. And we've had to step into the success model that's been pre-created for us, right, by men, in order to compete for leadership positions. And as has been said, many gains have been made. Of course, they have been, but not enough. I mean, you can still see who leads um, and who sits on the boards of our largest blue chip companies today. You know, it's not really the women, and we're losing more and more women CEOs who are stepping back because they just don't want to fight this fight anymore. But having said that, um, we have to fight this fight. And, uh, you know, I'm speaking to the converted, obviously, and <laughs> the, the thousand people who are, who are watching us. Um, and there are, there are so many reports out there now. You know, we read McKinsey's reports coming out every week. You know, how will businesses be successful going forward? How should business leaders lead? Um, and we're so aware that we're living in a world that's dependent on, the, on each other. Things are transparent. And this is when feminine values are most needed. And the last McKinsey report I read just this morning spoke about, you know, the next CEO has to be flexible, nurturing, empathetic, collaborative. And I stopped and I'm like, hmm, that sounds kind of familiar. Yeah, it's a woman. It's a woman. Yeah. yeah. Right. And there's actually been research done on this. There was a, a, there was a book called The Tina Doctrine. If you hadn't, haven't read it, you really should read it. There was a research done of 64,000 people across 13 countries. Um, representing, you know, every kind of geopolitical economic diversity. And with the interesting fact was that there's a global reckoning that businesses and institutions have too much power uh, and they're not producing the best outcomes. And over two thirds of the respondents said that the world would be a better place if, if, if people could think. Like right, them. right. So oh, Mona. I don't think it's yeah. such a radical thought I, and yeah. let's just get this done. Right, it's right. Good. Let's get it. Let's get it done. Thank you so much. Thank you. And almost 2,000 people, Mona, you know, I mean, that's the, thanks wow. everybody for, for, for signing up today. Uh, one more reminder, please share your thoughts on social media with the hashtag electing equality. You may donate by texting the word vote to 243-725. That's 243-725. The program's being recorded will be available on our Facebook and YouTube pages. And closed captioning uh, is also available by clicking at the bottom of the screen. We've talked about, about this uh, already some, but we have uh, two people who you know, have been powerful, uh, impressive voices uh, for this. We're talking about 
the systemic inequality, personal safety, violence against women, uh, Tina Chen and Alyssa Milano. Uh, if you could please uh, talk to us about your thoughts on, sure. on those subjects. Sure. And the, yeah. sure. I mean, I think when you uh, look at equality through the feminist lens, you know, we are looking at the the true intersectionality of of gender, you know, race, class, um, disability, religion, um, and really what we're looking for is is the elimination of any hierarchy. And the time is now. I mean, after after Me Too, you know, we've we've seen that people really act differently when they know that they're going to be held accountable for their actions, right? I mean, we saw the, the, the richest and most powerful men um, are also starting to get that, you know, that, that no matter um, how rich or powerful they may be, there are going to be consequences. They're, they're being shamed and fired and ostracized for predatory, uh, discriminatory behavior, um, you know, but when men abuse women, um, they should be held accountable not only by, by the media, not only by their employers, not only by the public, but they should also be held accountable by our justice system. Right, and that's really what the Equal Rights Amendment would afford us. And and the Times Up Legal Defense Fund, you know, that was a a crucial first step by ensuring that that uh, every woman who has suffered uh, harassment and abuse has access to a lawyer. Um, but really, uh, uh, enshrining our equal rights in the United States Constitution. Um, the the ERA would guarantee that every woman is protected um, by the full force of, of federal law as well. Um, so I'm just curious to hear from Tina what she thinks will be the most impactful change that that will, will bring. Well, first of all, I, I, I want to acknowledge Alyssa and thank you for your voice. And, thank you. you know, strength, you know, your clarity of, of, of when you speak about these issues and, and your courage and, you know, you are an inspiration to, my, to me and to so many of us. So thank That's you. That's very kind. Thank you. And as you are, all of you are, are my heroes. Thank you. Well, on, on these very specific issues that you and I work on, which is anti-sexual harassment, anti-sexual abuse and sexual assault, you know, let's be clear, the protections that we currently enjoy against those under federal law are a matter of, you know, Title VII and Title IX, you know, legislative law and, you know, interpretation, right, in the case of sexual harassment by the Supreme Court in the Meritor Bank case, and in the case of Title IX to try to protect students, you know, in our colleges and universities and high schools from sexual assault, you know, interpretation by the Obama administration, which was now, as we know, overturned by the Trump administration. And so that is just a, 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 a graphic illustration as we sit here today of how fragile these protections are. Even when we think we have Title IX, you know, that, you know, protects against sexual discrimination on campus. And we very clearly saw that if you don't have a system that protects students from sexual assault on campus, then sex discrimination is happening. And how quickly, how quickly it took for Secretary DeVos and the Trump administration to flip that on its head. And to actually, and, and we know one in four young women will experience sexual assault on our campuses. For those of us who are the parents of college age students, we are, we should be terrified, you know, and, you know, this doesn't mean even with the pandemic, it's not going to happen. You know, college, you know, kids are still interacting with each other under the rubric of their schools. They're in high schools and this is happening. Um, but that's because we are, we don't have that equal, you know, the Equal Rights Amendment, that language that says, Discrimination on the basis of sex is, un, you know, is unconstitutional enshrined there, which allows this kind of flipping back and forth and in interpretation, and we are subject then, you know, just to the vagaries of who's in office, who's controlling the pen. 
Um, and to a question I saw in the chat, how's that going to help transgender? Well, that is where, as Ellie pointed out, the decision interpreting what does the word sex mean in the context of Title VII? You know, when you know, transgender rights were expanded under Title VII by the Supreme Court when they interpreted it in June this year, will actually demonstrates that that language that we have in the Equal Rights Amendment is going to protect our transgender brothers and sisters too, right? And, and so it is expansive, it is inclusive. It is, you know, Alice Paul was brilliant 97 years ago when she put this language together because it is language like the rest of our constitution that encompasses our growing understanding of diversity, our growing understanding of who we are as a nation and as a population. And it is encompassing and can protect us, which is why, you know, this is, you know, so fitting with the rest of the Bill of Rights you know, as that kind of language that can be used to provide the protections that we need to break down the structural barriers as we've been talking about, all yeah. left around equal pay and pay the, the discrimination we face. So I think it's so important and I wanna really thank you, Carol, and really everyone as part, who have been carrying this banner for so long, <laughs> and getting us so close, so yeah. close to the finish line here. Well, thank, thank you, Tina, so much. And I know that you, you have a press of, of business as well. It's terrific that you were able to stay with us as long. If you, if you have to leave, we, we do understand, but it's just been terrific to have you here. And, well, thank uh, you. And just thank you, Carol, for including me. Thank you to Alyssa for us to being, to get, being able to interact together. We do a lot of stuff like by you know, text, and it's so great to see you. <laughs> see you. <laughs> Um, and, and to serve everyone on this call, it's been an honor, honor to be with you all. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you. much, Tina. Oh, love you, Elizabeth, Tina. Did, did you have some final words you wanted to say on the subject? I mean, I just think I would like to, I mean, like Dolores Huerta says, every moment is an organizing opportunity. Um, and I would just like to leave this phone call with some calls to action, with some real legitimate, I mean, there's, there's a question in this chat that I think is really important um, from, from a guy who says, how can men be most helpful in promoting both the ERA and true equality? Um, and, and I really just want to send our listeners off with some tangible um, actions that they can take to support this movement in this moment. Great, great. Well, I think you lead us right to uh, Ellie Smeal, who is going to give us that call to action. And also another question, Ellie, if you could address it as well, uh, is that we haven't touched on, because we're in, a, in this environment, we didn't touch on the court cases yet. But if you could say a couple of words about that, where we are with that, and then give us this great call to action. You have five minutes. Okay. Well, on the, on the court cases, and, and um, we did get a lot of questions about it. Um, and we were going to have one of the lawyers who put it, our brief together. I want to thank the ERA Coalition. You did a great job on that. Uh, what, where we are is the major case is the case brought by the Attorney Generals of uh, Nevada, Illinois, and Virginia. Their, their argument is quite simple. They're saying the amending process is clear. The amending process does not give a role to the President of the United States. The amending process uh, doesn't say anything about time limits and the mending process. The one I love is one is that uh, is that it, it says that we have to have 38 states or, th or three fourths. We got them. And uh, by the way, the, um, the the states have rescinded. That uh, doesn't count because if you start counting rescissions, you'd lose other major portions of the of the Constitution. So the reality is where we are is that's what's before the court. The, the Department of Justice under the attorney bar instructed the archivist not to certify the amendment, amendment uh, because of the time limit. And as they say, uh, there wasn't even a Department of Justice when they passed the amending process, number one. And number two, the president was purposely given no role. Now, what we hope will happen, obviously, we're calling this elect um, e equality. We want to make this an issue of this election. We believe that uh, that President Biden will reverse Trump's orders to the Department of Justice and say to the uh, archivist, they got the states, certify it. And, um, and that basically we also hope 
that at the same time, we're going to have a flip in the Senate and we will have a majority. And I know that we have to have six votes under current rules, but let's be real. They could be the, the um, whole filibuster law could be changed. And, and I am convinced that the public is sick and tired of Senate's being blocked uh, and blocking legislation. So I believe we have a chance at both. Now, what's our call to action? We got to make this bigger. We got to help. You know, just like uh, Johnson said to the civil rights movement, go out there and make me do it. Uh, I think that we have to make this a big issue. Uh, uh, the ERA coalition will be organizing and organizing, and so will the feminist majority. And now we have a big election campaign. Uh, we are trying to flip the Senate. We're trying to bring out a student vote. We're trying to make sure there's a large women's vote. We want this to be a massive organizing thing. And so we could use your help. We can use our help two ways. One, you can support us with contributions and everything here is going to be split. And, but most importantly, you can, you can help as volunteers. And so help us. Don't let this pass. We've got to do two things. As, as uh, Michelle Obama says, we have to save the democracy. We have to stop the uh, direction that we're going in, which is not tenable. And uh, we got to put people who believe in science in and all those basic things. But we also have to put in people who believe in equality and justice under the law. And so help us. And if you have either time or money, we'll put you to good use. Okay, great wrap up, great call to action. Uh, I wanna thank uh, everybody, all of our panelists, all of our special guests. Thanks for being flexible as the elected officials came in and out. Uh, you all were fantastic at such terrific perspectives on uh, equality for girls and women and for all of us in this country. So we're very, 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 very appreciative and so appreciative to, appreciative to, to you out there too who have uh, joined us uh, today. Uh, we want you to vote. <laughs> uh, that, is the, that is the most important thing for you to do. Uh, you have to vote for candidates who support women. The question is, do they support the ERA? The coalition will have a website up soon to help you determine that. Uh, you can search your representative from president on down. Uh, and that's the important thing to do it on down to look at all of your candidates. Uh, so we will have that up soon. A feminist majority is doing terrific organizing work uh, on campuses with the young people. You can join them. Uh, we're all working together. This is really, as we said, the final push. Uh, we can do this. We're extremely close. Uh, in the Senate, some targets are Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina, Iowa, and Michigan uh, for your Senate uh, targets. And also to be careful to keep track of what's going on in the unratified state legislatures, because if we're talking about rescissions where some may be able to take back their ratifications we need, a full 50 state strategy. We're working to make sure that all 50 states ratify the ERA. So once again, thank you all uh, so much for being with us today. We will see you the next time. And by all means, go vote. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you all. It's been fun. Thanks so much, everybody. Yeah.